Hello and welcome to the WHN broadcast. I'm your host, Katie Marsh. The U.S. has announced it will be ending its COVID-19 public health emergency declaration on May 11th. Many are concerned about the far-reaching effects. How will this affect access to tests, vaccines, treatments, health coverage, food support, and other social services? What does this mean for you, your family, and your community? In this episode, we will hear from our experts, Dr. Kavita Patel and Dr. Eric Feigelding. Kavita and Eric, it is so great to have you with us today. Let's start with answering just generally, like what is the U.S. Declaration of Public Health Emergency for COVID-19? Thanks for having me. Uh, And I'll just briefly start. Well, the public health emergency is a special type of emergency that was enacted approximately three years ago when COVID was first emerging and surging. And it grants um, the president and uh, the HHS secretary broad powers to uh, mobilize additional funding, additional staff and resources, uh, and loosen existing uh, rules and regulations um, for things such as eligibility for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, food stamps, and many other federal uh, regulations that basically can be exempted uh, or or added upon uh, during such an emergency. And but right now the, the big debate is that what will happen once this declaration of public health emergency is ending in approximately a month from now? And there's a lot of worry, concern, consternation about what benefits uh, the federal government will no longer be providing to the public sector. And that's, I think, many ways why we're here to discuss a lot of these upcoming changes. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, So what services do Americans stand to lose when this public health emergency declaration ends? Uh, Kavita can chime in, uh, uh, but I I think, first of all, the, the biggest concern the biggest worry is that the eligibility for Medicaid uh, will suddenly um, change because previously they were they skipped checks for a lot of eligibilities across different states, but now these states can resume their checks. So it depends on how what state you live in and how quickly the uh, the enforcement of eligibility checks is reinstated, but. Anywhere from four to fifteen million people are may lose eligibility, and this is obviously a huge number that will affect a lot of the poor, impoverished, as well as those who are have some sort of disability. Um, and of course, food stamps is the other key thing where the benefits are set to uh, the extra add-on supplemental food stamp benefits are set to expire. And this could anywhere mean from, you know, um, you know, six dollars in uh, a week for some people, but on average, it could be for an average family, approximately a reduction of eighty-two dollars, and it could be even more depending on your bracket of eligibility and how many people are in your family. So this foods this slash the food stamp benefits anywhere from, you know, ten percent to a quarter to maybe half depending on your family situation is going to be devastating to the general public. Uh, of course, there's going to be el- el- um, availability changes of, of other testing and um, vaccines, but those don't immediately kick in. Um, but the, the food stamps and Medicaid eligibility are the biggest concerns. Thanks, Eric. Um, what about international implications? Well, this is not exactly... A, uh, international declaration. The public health emergency international concern is a declaration comes from the WHO. Although the WHO has also been discussing the end of the PHEIC. The last meeting about a month or two ago, the WHO said they will soon, they may vote to end it at the next meeting, which could, I think it's coming up in a few weeks or a month. But, uh, Basically, you know, when many countries start dropping their public health emergency, um, the WHO uh, could, could also spur WHO to end the public health emergency. But this inherently is the problem. There's this domino effect is uh, is actually denying the fact that 
COVID is still an emergency. It just, governments just are not going to treat it as an emergency in the future because it has not really uh, gone down to seasonal um, virus status. You know, many other countries have said it's it's just seasonal now, but that assumes that a you're vaccinated and uh, and boosted with the most recent booster, and you have wide availability of Paxlovid, which internationally, um, you know, bivalent boosters haven't been really available. Um, you know, in developing countries. And Paxlovid is actually pretty difficult to obtain in, in many countries. So, and we know monoclonal antibodies don't really work anymore. So I think internationally, this is just going to create a, a worsening domino effect. And um, when the next COVID wave of variants comes around, and it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, this will just be potentially devastating. And so I think this, it, it's, it's, it's more of the, if the U.S., which is one of the largest countries in the world, drops it, many other countries will also follow the U.S.'s lead. And it'll set a really bad precedent since most countries uh, are not as wealthy or as well-funded with resources as the U.S. Yeah, that brings us to a question we received from Sky from Twitter. Um, is the U.S. basing their decision to end the public health emergency on any scientific data from your perspective? Yeah, this is inherently what frustrates me and many other epidemiologists the most. The The end of the public health emergency um, is not inherently like, oh, deaths have dropped to near zero, hospitalizations have dropped to near zero. It's it's not like uh, like based on an empirical justification. It's just a political decision for the most part that, mm, you know, we're not having overwhelming surges and therefore, you know, and in the interest of, you know, saving government funds uh, or, you know, just uh, reinstating all these rules uh, for, you know, Medicaid uh, checks that, oh, we're going to drop this. And I think that's, it's very short-sighted because in many ways, you know, just like many companies chase quarterly earnings instead of long-term uh, earnings, um, the government sometimes tries to uh, go for quick wins rather than long-term pandemic prevention and management wins. And I think this is where it's very frustrating because we have millions of people who are vulnerable, who have long COVID, who, are, who need these resources to protect themselves and support themselves and their family. Um, and I think that a lot of people who've been, you know, disabled and been relying on Medicaid support and food stamp support will suddenly be in a world of hurt. We're now all, all of a sudden just throwing a lot of these vulnerable people and impoverished people under under the under the wheels um and i and i think that's oftentimes the most frustrating because these are the invisible people in our society who don't um you know just like squeaky wheel gets the oil these people are, don't have the voices and capacity to squeak as loud as many other special interests and to, to push the dropping of this public health emergency yeah, and we're and we're seeing concern exactly from that um, vulnerable community. Um, we have Raya from Twitter, who's wondering that after the public health emergency ends, you know, will things like needing to remove your mask, you know, at the airport, um, be something that they might face? Um, we are seeing uh, this discussion um, in New York City as well. Um, so people are really worried about sort of the trickle down right. effect of it, it's this. The optics of and the message that the public health emergency declaration ending sends. Uh, just to be clear, the mass mandates were never um, part of the public health emergency per se, um, and uh, it's just that uh, it, more companies and more cities and municipalities will be empowered to you know, re reject even recommendations. We're not even talking about mandates, recommendations. Like if you see what New York City mayor and New York NYPD police chief said recently, um, oh, you know, uh, businesses need to tell people to take off their masks as opposed to 
you know, not mandate, not just recommend, but now telling people to do the opposite, to rip their masks off. Um, and oftentimes they're equating mask wearing to criminal activity. This is actual quote from NY New York uh, Police Department chief that, you know, you know, in order to fight crime or in order to catch criminals, um, you know, you need to take off your mask because masks somehow equal criminal activity. And, and this is just ludicrous and you know, in, incredibly irresponsible. But, you know, in many ways, hey, the government is uh, the federal government's ending the public health emergency. This only lends fuel to that explosive fire that's in, in horribly stigmatizing a fire. Because right now, you know, we're not even fighting for mandates or recommendations anymore. We're fighting for the basic minimum for the people's abilities to wear a mask in public and not be stigmatized or not be chastised by uh, the police chiefs. Um, and this is the f inherently the fight. And this is inherently the the war that is, um, that is raging. Now, I think right now COVID is not... Uh, uh, middle of a winter surge like before, even though it's, we're still in the middle of winter. But I think, you know, in certain ways with the general public, I'm saving my ammos to, you know, um, blow the whistle of when we need to get everybody to mask again or or do take other mass mitigations again because we need to save our, our powder for when uh, it gets worse again. But in many ways... Just the bare minimum of protecting vulnerable people in society, whether it's through Medicaid, food stamps, or just allowing them to wear a mask without being stigmatized, this public health emergency declaration ending is is going to send a lot of people into harm's way and into a, a very dangerous world of being stigmatized and potentially, you know, fits fights and and uh, and public disputes. Um, and I think that's a very very dangerous society uh, that we're entering. Um, and of course, there's many other things that's changing with the public health emergency um, that's also going to be very frustrating in the near future once we run out of testing and 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 uh, vaccines. Sure. Yeah, and that brings us to the point where the public health emergency hasn't ended quite yet, although we do know that certain parts of it are already rolling back in certain states and in certain programs, but there is still opportunity to order tests. Um, and that should be something that uh, folks look into. Right. Um, and I think people should know that we have until approximately early or mid May when, you know, right now every person can get free tests, whether, and it's not just rapid tests, but eight free rapid or, uh, PCR t uh, tests uh, that are FDA approved and get it reimbursed from your insurance. This is eight per person. So if you have a family of three, you can have um, 24 tests per month reimbursed. Uh, and afterwards, um, this is right now a, a mandate uh, to the insurance companies. After May, it is anyone's guess. Will they still do this? Will insurance companies still cover it? It's like they could easily say, "Oh, well, it's not emergency anymore. We're not going to cover it anymore," and um, this is this is in many ways incredibly uh, dangerous. And speaking of testing, uh, right now laboratories are required to report tests to the CDC, but um, but after the ends, CDC HHS will no longer have the authority to require the reporting of tests. Um, you know, vaccination rates and hospital data, other and although hospital data will still be reported, but at a much lower frequency, um, it's it, it becomes a free for all of you know are certain states going to keep up the testing, uh, reporting, vaccine vaccination rate reporting, and the hospitalization data reporting in terms of the same level quality standards and the frequency. There are very, very limited rules after this, and that's inherently the extremely frustrating part in addition to the availability of these tests. So my recommendation now is order as many tests for your family, eight per person per month uh, from your insurance while you can. And again, it's not just rapid tests, but it could also be any COVID test that's uh, FDA approved. And there are actual you know, COVID plus flu tests, combination tests that you could also take advantage of 
under this um, under this benefit. And everyone should uh, while you still can. Absolutely. Yeah, and finally, um, of course, there's always concern about children, as Sophia has raised from Twitter. Um, she is pointing out that children are still certainly dying of COVID and just wondering, again, children are going to suffer um, because of this um, de declaration of this ending as well. Yeah, I think I think the a lot of illness will continue. It, that's inevitable because you know if you <laughs> the, the definition of you know insanity is if you continue on your course and not improve anything and hoping things will just improve on their own, right? Um, that's just um, just complete fantasy and i think you know a lot of children you know the omicron variants are much more severe in children than they were in children in the first two years uh, the earliest variants weren't affecting children as much but uh, somehow the newer omicron variants and the sub variants are affecting children a lot more uh, affecting as well and you know i always remind people there's more children hospitalized and who've died in 2022 um, than in 2020 and 2021. Um, and, and you know, for those who said, oh, we have vaccines now, yeah, but, you know, pediatric uptake of COVID vaccines have been very, very poor. Like, this data have been abysmal. We're lucky if we get to um, 15, 20, 30 percent of, uh, of kids. And, and it's even lower if you're talking about the the boosters, right? The, there's because there's now bivalent boosters for children five to eleven, but the uptake of bivalent boosters for children is even lower. So we haven't adequately protected kids. Um, you know, children uh, even younger than five have not been. Uh, you know, I don't even think the booster is available to them right now as well. The, the new bivalent ones, um, Novavax is also not available either to to children under eighteen. Um, and I think I think the Paxlovid drug. I think I think I don't think it's available to children, um, if I recall correctly, or at least the, very, the youngest children. So a, a lot of these things that these to, so-called tools that we have, they are not that available. And um, and I think the long COVID right now, you know, I think for example, people think long COVID is just people who are elderly, frail, or have a severe immunocompromised risk factor. No, it's for many healthy people who are suffering from long COVID too. People who were previously ran, um, ran every day can run like, you know, ran cross country races and participate in other sports. Um, and people who are relatively young and healthy. And I just reminded of, um, of, my friend uh, Diana Cowan, a physics girl, she's she's a YouTuber and she used to do PBS uh, physics shows. Um, and she was, you know, she used to ride in these vomit comets, you know, at jets um, and sh demonstrate the laws of physics to people. And now she's basically completely debilitated in bed, bedridden, cannot even read the phone. She has family members read text messages to her. Um, and because she just is completely not just tired bedridden, but completely disabled in bed, um, hospitalized oftentimes and, and family members taking care of her 24 seven. This person was someone who was really healthy before and did a lot of these acrobatic, you know, um, you know, these skydiving, uh, you know, type stunts before and i think people just don't see that you know because oftentimes these people once they're debilitated they leave the views of society you don't see them walking on the streets out of sight out of mind right and this out of sight out of mind phenomenon with long COVID is is horrible basically if you can't join society that's tough luck you can't participate in society and i think that's where the extreme amount of frustration among long COVID, COVID sufferers are um and it's building and and I think it will only continue to build and hopefully it will it will it won't be too late before a, a critical mass of people are frustrated and get angry and rise up about um, long COVID sufferers being debilitated. I also want to remind people 
the CDC just recently, uh, like last month, basically put out a, a report. It's not a public report, but it's a it's a special like new guidance to death certificate uh, coding um, managers and and staffs that says COVID can have long lasting effects for many weeks, months, and years. This is a quote: weeks, months, and years after the initial infection. And therefore, COVID can be an underlying cause of death and should be marked as an underlying cause of death on death certificates um, even many weeks, months, and years after the initial infection. And this is the first time the government has acknowledged that the the, the effects could be weeks, months, and years um, potentially after um, after the initial infection. Um, and this is just the deaths, which is, of course, just tip of the iceberg of all the long COVID disability um, and cardiovascular neurological, which this document also acknowledged. So, again, there was announced with almost no fanfare. It was, it was a quiet update to an existing document. and um, But it, it is a very public acknowledgement of these risks. But, hey, public health emergency, we're, uh, we're ending it next month. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a really important point to realize that the CDC is acknowledging that that needs to be included in death certificates. Um, but overall, the surveillance uh, is really um, going to be very unreliable after this yeah. uh, declaration ends. Uh, Dr. Patel, a question for you. Uh, could you speak about what will be happening to uh, the emergency use authorizations uh that have been um, going on since uh, the public health emergency has been in place. Yeah, and Katie, thanks for having me. Sorry, I had some AV issues and uh, Eric, I think, filled in nicely. So I'm just going to try to hopefully not take up too much time, but add to what um, has already been said. So public health, there are several types of declarations uh, related to different emergencies, including the public health emergency. Everything that Eric has been speaking to and a number of things not just beyond even HHS, such as the food benefits, et cetera, really are done under what's called Section 319 of the Public Health Service Act, which is incredibly broad. But Section 319 states that the HHS secretary can issue a determination or a declaration that a public health emergency exists. That's that's just helpful. What is also a little confusing but sits separately is other declarations under another section called 564 of a different act, the F Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Yeah, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And that enables the issuance of EUAs. So it is possible to have a declaration of the public health emergency being over, such as we've been discussing, that'll take effect in May. But the emergency declarations that are enabled by that section under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act sit separately and will continue. Those That is where all of the applicable language is for any of the emergency use authorizations related to vaccines, to testing, to um, in vitro diagnostics. It also applies to like personal protective devices and some of the new technology in that space. And that means that uh, that declaration, that section 564, would also have to be declared over and ended. And that is not the case. This public health emergency declaration really applies to that 319 of the Public Health Service Act. So therefore, an EUA can remain in place beyond the end of that um, Section 319 declaration. So that's that's how I think people can have at least some comfort that the availability of these technologies, we can describe, you know, as Eric did, that like if you don't have access to insurance, that that will be hard to get, but we will at least have that. And I think that's important. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Kavita and Eric, for joining us today. Uh, please check out the links attached to this broadcast. For more information and helpful resources, check out our website, whn.global. If you'd like to connect, with like-minded individuals and families in your local areas, join covidmeetups.com. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. We look forward to seeing you soon.